In the previous video I've introduced my homebrew high-level computer language called min, which I've written in Python in only 230 lines of code. The look and feel of min resembles Python itself. My design goal was to let me easily code Tetris in it. And min to me is a fun learning experience helping me to understand how computer languages work from the bottom up. Today I'll be explaining some of Min's key inner logic without going too much into coding details. I have developed Min to ultimately have it run on this minimal CPU system here. And today may be that day. I fine-tuned this homebrew CPU design for more than two years now. Always minimizing complexity while maximizing performance. And it's quite fun to use. It is entirely built from TTL logic without any integrated CPU and still reaches the processing power of a Commodore 64. The Minimal has its own native assembler and text editor, a real-time cycle exact emulator along with extensive documentation. It's been quite a ride to put all this together. You find the links in the description below. So, at the end of this video, we will be ready to see whether this tiny piece of hardware will be able to support a high-level programming language. If so, the minimal CPU system can be set to provide the full learning experience from TTL to sort of Python, which at least to my knowledge is quite unique. But first things first, let's see how Min is doing its job. Min is an interpreter that takes your plain source text and interprets it character by character without changing or tokenizing your code into any sort of intermediate representation. For sure this is not too efficient, but I think it really helps to make the base concepts accessible. And we can always optimize later. In order to keep track of where and what Min currently interprets, Min employs some internal state. Just a bunch of global variables, really. Since they control a lot of min's behavior, let's make ourselves familiar with them. With the index variable PC for program counter, min keeps track of the current file position. A halt flag can be set to stop min executing instructions. Red is just a temporary container holding the return value of a call. And sub and loop keep track of the current subroutine and loop nesting level, which will be important at a later time. While running, min measures the indentation at the current position and compares it to a target indentation. When entering indented blocks, min stores the outside indentation in an out variable. Ok, with that out of the way, let us analyze how min accesses your code through tiny dedicated functions. A look function simply returns the character at the current position while at the same time detecting and skipping over comments. And a take function returns that current character and moves to the next character. At the same time, take keeps track of the current indentation, that is, sets the measured indentation to zero after every new line and counts the spaces until a first non white space character is hit. This value is stored in the variable mind. There are several less important access functions, which I will not cover in detail here. They skip over white spaces, read in an identifier or a specific string and so on. Let me at this point only highlight the function skip to indent. It advances over code until the measured indentation is less or equal a given value. This makes it a key function to implement Python style indentation, that is, skipping over an inactive code block. Which brings us to our first real topic. How to handle inactive code blocks. Inactive code must not be executed. There are three ways code can become inactive. A. By a condition evaluating to false within an if or while control statement. Or B by a break within an otherwise active while block, or C, by a return inside a subroutine. The general idea here is to always use the indentation level to skip over inactive parts. Let's take a look at the implementation of the return statement first. Within a subroutine block, a return statement essentially does two things. It sets the halt flag and forwards the program counter 
until it hits indentation 0 again, reaching the end of the sub. Halt will make any active child block from inside the subroutine stop and hand back control to its parent block, effectively ending the processing of the whole subroutine and all of its nested blocks. These affected blocks will clean up their own local variables in reverse order and hand back control to the subroutine calling function do call here. Only do call will finally reset the halt flag right at the end of its cleanup and set the program counter to the next instruction. In min, the functions do if and do while handle control structs. In case their condition is not met, they will skip their corresponding code block again by using the indentation. Within a while block, for example, a break statement will set the halt flag and skip back to the block's outside indentation level, effectively ending any line of simple statements and shutting down the block, including its nested blocks. At this point you may be wondering why all this sounds kind of complicated. A return from subroutine simply means resuming execution at where we've left, right? So why can't we just store this address in a global variable? Well, let's keep in mind that in a programming language everything may be nested. Any way out has to be exactly the way in, just backwards. Thus the way to go here is to store everything in a first in last out stack. In Python this stack is not used explicitly. It is hidden in the recursive nature of the code of min in conjunction with the declaration and destruction of local variables. Let's move on to simple function definitions and calls. In min, a def statement is only allowed at indentation level 0. After parsing the def keyword, the interpreter reads the following identifier, including its first open round bracket, and stores it together with the current file position in a call dictionary. The rest of the function definition and the function body is ignored until indentation 0 is hit again. A function call in its simplest form, that is, without arguments, involves storing away the current file position and target indentation and loop level and resuming interpretation at the file position associated with the subroutine identifier's code block. Now, before we analyze functions with parameters and arguments, let us talk about variables. Variables created at indentation 0 are stored as globals. They are visible from everywhere in the code. The scope of all other variables, however, is generally limited to the subroutine they were created in. And inside a subroutine, the scope of a variable is further narrowed down to the block in which it was defined. For example, a variable created inside a while loop will cease to exist after the loop has finished. Last but not least, we want to allow for referencing variables in function calls. That is, we want to be able to create variable names that point to already existing data, such that a function is able to store results not only in its return value, but also in a container variable provided by the caller. I know, I know, in modern languages this problem is solved more elegantly, but remember, every language involves compromises, and I want this one to be really simple and run on very limited hardware. There might be smarter ways to account for all these cases here, but I came up with the following. We are going to need two data structures here, a dictionary and a data list. The identifier of a variable is stored in the dictionary and a new element holding the actual value of the variable is created at the end of the data list. The variable identifier together with the type information and the index of that new data entry they form a key value pair in the dictionary. It is important to note here that both data structures preserve the order in which we append new elements, that is, we can both use as a stack by appending and popping off entries. We are going to store global variables under their clear name in this dictionary. The local variables are stored with a suffix appended to their name indicating the subroutine level. This way of tagging variables makes sure that in any given subroutine level our program only sees global variables and local variables specific to that subroutine. 
Upon leaving a code block of, for example, a while or if statement, all variables and data entries created inside this block are discarded. In order to do so, min only needs to keep track of the size of these two data structures prior to entering the code block and after leaving the code block, we pop off elements until that size is reached again. This will also be recursion safe. Pretty neat, isn't it? Now let us consider how to implement function calls involving parameters. We will employ two file pointers for that, one parsing the callee's parameter list and one parsing the caller's argument list. For each parameter found, a local variable is generated such that it can be reached from inside the call. And if a parameter is marked as a reference with a leading ampersand, the corresponding argument must be a variable too. In that case, only its data index is copied into the local parameter variable. And if the parameter is not a reference, a new data entry will be made receiving the value of the argument's expression, and this will be done by copy. Handling return values is also pretty straightforward. A return statement, followed by an expression, stores that result in the global state of the interpreter and hands back control to the caller. Gaining back control, the caller can then store this value in an assignment. Finally, let's talk about how min handles types, arrays and expressions. Min accepts only two types of data, integers as single values or one-dimensional arrays and strings, which are treated as arrays too. In contrast to Python, min has static typing meaning that a variable receives its type by its initial declaration and that type cannot be changed afterwards. When dealing with variables of different type, it's obvious that we need to keep a record of the type along with the identifier and the data index of that variable. Not worrying too much about efficiency here, I've chosen to store the data type in clear text as a string. I'm using an i for integer, IA for integer array and CA for character array. So far so good. I hope my brief overview provides you with a jump start in case you plan on diving deeper into this topic and into my code. Now let us turn to something more exciting. In the introduction I have already promised you an implementation on my minimal CPU system. And well, here it is. I have written an assembly version of min. The object code is just under 8 kilobytes, so that there's plenty of memory left to run our text editor and to store source data. I'll give you a demo on the emulator first, but at the end of this video I'll also prove that min runs just as nicely on real TTL. One word of warning before you complain, min is running rather slowly on this limited hardware, but remember all this is meant as a proof of concept not as a speed record. Min's 230 lines of Python code exploded into 1500 lines of assembly and it was quite a challenge to get everything up and running reliably. Let's assemble and upload the stuff into the minimal now. The native text editor is playing together quite nicely with Min. The editor is sitting in memory at hex 8000. Source text starts at hex 9000. And min is located at hex C000. So we have about 8k left for writing our code. Let's start with some simple stuff and print out text to the console. Let's add a variable and some math expressions. And make it a while loop.
All right, that's looking good. I have opted not to include an input function into min's direct syntax, since this functionality can easily be implemented within min itself. I have added the possibility to include pre-written code. Let's take a look at std.min. Here we can see a bunch of useful terminal functions like clearing the screen and positioning the cursor, as well as the input function and a string to integer conversion. Let us use this to write a simple console application now. And we can also write Tetris here, of course. As you can see, I've written Tetris in a very modular way, in only 123 lines of min. Although I must admit, the playability is not that great. Yeah, it's close to being playable, I guess. Now as a final step, let me fire up the real hardware and upload min. As always, you find the links to my source code down in the description. Let me just quickly paste min to the terminal here. Okay, I guess we're ready to code in Python style on the minimal CPU. Remember, it's just a bunch of TTL chips, really. So this brings me more or less to the summit of my three-year-long climb exploring the long way from TTL to Python. Please leave a comment and let me know what you think about Min. Thanks a lot for following along. Take care. Bye.